We Muslims also fought to secure American independence from Great Britain in the American Revolutionary War. Consider the case of Yusuf bin Ali, also known as Joseph bin Hali, who was a Muslim from Arab stock in 18th century Africa. He was found wandering in the American wilderness by General Thomas Sumner shortly before the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War. And when that war began, Yusuf was one of the very first to volunteer for General Sumner's brigade. Throughout the entire length of the Revolutionary War, Yusuf served as a scout for Sumner's brigade and later settled down in Sumner County, South Carolina. Yes, we Muslims fought to gain American independence in the first place. And a few years later, we stood armed and ready to defend the American coastline from British invasion in the War of 1812. Consider the case of Bilali Muhammad, a Muslim from the Fulbe tribe of Timbo in Guinea, West Africa. Muhammad was educated in Arabic and Quranic studies in West Africa and may well have been in training to become an Imam. Around 1802 he landed in Georgia as an enslaved African and he was purchased by Thomas Spaulding of Sapello Island, Georgia. Bilali was so exceptional that he actually became the overseer of the entire plantation. Usually this was a, uh, someone who was a white, but here was an enslaved African who was the overseer of the entire plantation. And Spaulding was so impressed with Bilali that we are told he did something quite unusual. He actually went to the trouble of going out and finding a copy of the Quran which he purchased and gave to Bilali. And he also allowed Bilali to build a small mosque on the plantation. Apparently the first mosque built in the United States of America sometime in the first two decades of the 19th century. Well, when the War of 1812 broke out, the British threatened to invade Sapello Island, Georgia, and they promised freedom to any slave who would rise up in rebellion against his owner. That, that's quite a carrot to hold out in front of someone. Well, Spaulding and his family prepared to flee from the threatened British invasion to leave the island. But before he fled, he called Bilali into him and asked him to organize the slaves to defend the island and Spaulding's property. Bilali said that he could make no promises for Spaulding's non-Muslim slaves but he promised that every Muslim slave would fight to the death to preserve Spaulding's property. So impressed was Spaulding with Bilali that he actually went to the extent of arming Bilali and his fellow Muslim slaves with 80 muskets. To my knowledge, the only time in American history in which a slave owner dared to give guns to his slaves. This is how exceptional the character of Bilali Muhammad was. His word was his bond. The people of Sapelo Island are the direct descendants of African slaves brought to the colony of Georgia in the 1800s. The African American Sea Islanders living on Sapelo today have retained obvious elements of their African culture due to their unique chance to develop a society in virtual isolation from European-American domination.
Dr. Michael Harris of Morehouse College in Atlanta credits the Sea Island slaves with bringing a thousand years worth of rice farming experience to the American shores. His research shows that blacks farmed rice in Africa's region near the Senegal and Gambia rivers. The European slave buyers requested Africans with rice growing skills because they knew about Africa's farming technology. Many of these Africans settled in the Sea Islands. This information is often neglected in traditional history texts. To save more of Sapelo's culture, more people have to take an interest. But first, the islanders have to protect themselves from those outsiders who would try to take their land and their identity. We Muslims fought in the American Civil War to preserve the Union. Consider the case of Muhammad Ali ibn Said, who was born around the year 1833 in what is today Nigeria. He was educated as a child in Arabic, Quranic studies, and Turkish. At age 16, he was captured and enslaved in 1863. Muhammad enlisted in Company I of the 55th Regiment of the Massachusetts Colored Volunteers and fought in the Union Army in such battles as those at Fort Mims and Honey Hill in 1864 and at James Island and Biggin Creek, South Carolina in 1865. The Massachusetts 54th Regiment was the first black unit to be formed. The order from the War Department published in May of 1863 created a separate bureau of the U.S. Army. This separate bureau of the U.S. Army is where all the United States Colored Troop Regiments were mustered into service. So even the 54th Massachusetts, which retains its state designation, was brought in to the Bureau of United States Colored Troops. Although recruitment speeches promised black soldiers equality in the Union Army, they were not treated equally, yet they performed with distinction. Their courage on the battlefield really changed the opinion of many Americans of European descent. Because it was very clear after watching those soldiers on the battlefield that men of African descent could in fact fight. President Lincoln said that the war against the South could not have been won without the help of the black freedmen. He must have been quite a soldier too because he rose from the rank of private to sergeant in just his first two months in the Union Army. He left the military in 1865 with the close of the war and his autobiography was actually published in Atlantic Monthly, at that point perhaps the most prestigious magazine in America, and that publication was in the year 1867. We also helped tame and settle the American Wild West. Case in point, Haji Ali, who was born around the year 1828 in Syria, and at some point prior to 1856 completed the Hajj. In 1856 he entered the United States at Indianola, Texas with a shipment of 33 camels. Now, let me digress for a moment. Jefferson Davis was then Secretary of War. And Jefferson Davis had this concept of introducing a camel cavalry into the American Southwest. This was his great experiment. Of course, Americans knew absolutely nothing about camels. They didn't know how to feed them, they didn't know how to care for them, they didn't know how to ride them. So the obvious solution is you brought in a camel expert. And that camel expert was Haji Ali. Now, if you look in the American history books, you probably won't find Haji Ali talked about. Because Americans had just a terrible time getting their tongue around Haji Ali. And so they called him High Jolly. And you'll find High Jolly mentioned quite a bit in American history. Just off I-10 in the town of Quartzsite stands a pyramid gravestone to a curious name still celebrated in these parts, High Jolly. I Jolly was actually Haji Ali, a Greek Syrian immigrant who came to the United States in 1856. 
He worked for the Army as the caretaker of a herd of animals being used in an experiment aimed at establishing a new way to transport goods across the southwestern deserts by camel. The Civil War ended the Army's fascination with the camels, and they were turned loose in the desert. Ty Jolly remained a faithful Army scout for some 30 years and died in Quartzsite in 1902. Wild camels were spotted in Arizona as late as 1935, and some believe they still roam the desert, a haunting and romantic legacy of High Jolly, whose monument still attracts thousands of visitors every year. He became a U.S. citizen in the year 1880, taking the name of Philip Tadro. Later that year, he married and eventually fathered two daughters. He died at Tyson Wells, Arizona, on December 16, 1902. At the time of his death, he was one of the most beloved and colorful characters of the American Wild West. In fact, the state of Arizona erected a large monument over his grave, topping that monument with a large copper camel in remembrance of Haji Ali's service to the United States.